Uh, good afternoon. I'm pleased to be convening the second meeting of this session between the Conveners Group and the First Minister. I'd like to welcome the First Minister to the meeting today. Uh, I'd also like to welcome everyone who's come along to watch the session, whether online or here. Uh, this session gives conveners the opportunity to question the First Minister about the programme for government from the perspective of the Parliament's committees. Uh, First Minister, do you want to make a brief opening statement? Uh, other than to say thank you for giving me the opportunity, but uh, I'm happy now just to get into questions. Hope you're thanking us at the end. <laughs> Probably uh, not. <laughs> can I say to conveners, you've got about five minutes for your exchange, so I'm hopeful that you get at least one supplementary. If we have time, because I must conclude by approximately 1.50, if we have time and there's other supplementaries that they wish to get on, I'll try to get them in as well uh, from, from you, even if you've had your question. You're frowning at me, Margaret. Yeah, is it one question or you lots of time? You've got five minutes. Five minutes for one or two or three questions, depending how long the exchange takes. I'm afraid I have to so be about fierce about time control. We must finish at 1.50 uh, because of the sitting of Parliament. Uh, I call Joan McAlpine to be followed by Graham Simpson. Joan McAlpine for the Culture, Tourism, Europe... Relations Committee. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. Uh, First Minister, last weekend two surveys released uh, to the Financial Times painted a very bleak picture of the future for asset management uh, in the UK because of the decision to leave the EU. Scotland accounts for about 10% uh, of the jobs in asset management and many of those, as you'll know, are concentrated in our major cities, uh, Edinburgh, Glasgow <coughs> and Aberdeen. Uh, what what can the Scottish Government do to, to protect these really important jobs in the event of a hard Brexit? Well, thank you for the question. I think it probably goes without saying that I'm deeply concerned about the impact of Brexit generally, and uh, those concerns will undoubtedly be exacerbated if we are in the uh, realms of a hard Brexit. I'm aware of the uh, surveys that you refer to looking specifically at the financial services sector and within that at asset management and as you allude to yourself that's got particular relevance to Scotland because asset management is a, a key part of our financial services sector. I think it's estimated there are around £800 million of funds under management in Scotland so this really matters. Um, in terms of what we are doing, uh, firstly, and I suppose at the top level, we continue to argue strongly that uh, we shouldn't have a hard Brexit, that if the UK is leaving the EU, it should seek to remain within the single market and the customs union. I think that would be the easiest way of ensuring continuation of the arrangements that financial services and many other sectors depend on. Uh, more specifically with the financial services sector, we work very closely with it to try to make sure we are understanding its concerns and as far as possible uh, conveying those concerns to the UK government. I co-chair the Financial Services Advisory Board, uh, which looks at issues broader than Brexit, but it's not surprising uh, that Brexit has been a, a particular focus over recent months. We're also working through FISAB um, and uh, with the assistance of Scottish Financial Enterprise on particular pieces of work to play to the strength of our financial services sector, FinTech, for example, and SFE just now are leading work on a new financial services strategy. So that's specific to financial services. Just briefly, um, I think there is a wider point here about the impact of Brexit. We saw reports yesterday uh, estimating that the loss of economic output in Scotland uh, over the next few years could be 30 billion. Uh, I certainly would like to see more transparency around this from the UK government. There are suggestions that the UK government has sector-specific analysis of the impact of Brexit. There's a suggestion that it has a an analysis looking particularly at Scotland as a whole, but thus far there's been a refusal, I think as recently as this morning, to publish those analyses. I think that's unconscionable. I think the public have a right to know. So I hope we see publication of these different impact studies as soon as possible. Thank you. And you'll be, you'll be aware that financial services frameworks, there, there are, uh, there's governance of financial services frameworks at an EU level, particularly under uh, something called MFID2. Um, and those frameworks will come back uh, to the UK if Brexit goes ahead. Um, what can you do to support the devolution of those kind of rules um, which would allow the government to support financial services in Scotland? 
Well, there's a range of different policies, frameworks, directives, regulations at EU level that impact very directly on financial services that govern effectively the operation of financial services. Um, passporting is the one, uh, the, the arrangement most commonly talked about. That's more important for some aspects of the sector than for others, but it is hugely important. The point you're raising, which we may or may not come on to in, in later discussions, uh, around as powers uh, come back from... Brussels, to use that shorthand, where do they rest? Now, obviously, financial services regulation is not a devolved matter, although I think as uh, we uh, go further down this path, we would be arguing strongly and are arguing strongly that even things that are not devolved right now should be considered for devolution to give this parliament and government the greatest possible impact in putting in place the right arrangements. But at a more fundamental level, of course, we don't even have that agreement uh, to powers coming to this parliament in areas that are currently devolved, uh, which which is why right now uh, we are not able to, to recommend legislative consent to the withdrawal bill, and that clearly is a, an issue of ongoing discussion between the Scottish and UK governments. Thank you very much. Uh, Graham, Graham Simpson, to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Graham Simpson, for Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. Mr Simpson. Thanks very much. Uh, it kind of uh, follows on from uh, that, that line of questioning. Um, our committee is not a policy committee. Um, it deals with uh, process and scrutiny. Um, so with regard to the European Union withdrawal bill that creates the potential for um, huge numbers of uh, legal instruments to be placed before this parliament, um, possibly hundreds. Um, so what is the government doing to prepare for this unprecedented program of secondary legislation? How is it working with the UK government in making these preparations? And how will it work with the parliament, this parliament, to ensure that the parliament has the proper opportunity to scrutinise these instruments? Uh, well, these are very good and pertinent questions. Um, firstly, I think, I think everybody does understand this, but it is worth saying that the process of withdrawal from the EU will impact on, uh, I think without exception, every area of the responsibilities of the Scottish Parliament and Scottish Government. So this is you know, massive in terms of the, the work that this parliament in due course will, will have to do. Uh, you say, uh, and you will undoubtedly be right, that the need for uh, legislation, subordinate legislation perhaps in particular, will run into the, the hundreds rather of, of instruments that it may indeed run into uh, the thousands. We, we don't know that yet. So to try to deal with your questions in turn, uh, what are we doing to prepare for that? We're doing everything we can at the moment to assess across government what the impact is going to be, and in particular in relation to your questions, what the requirement for legislative action is likely to be. I have to be frank with uh, conveners, there is a, a limit to uh, the, the, the conclusions that we are able to reach at, at this stage for two closely connected reasons. Firstly, uh, we don't have, uh, in my view, anywhere near sufficient information from the UK government right now about what some of that impact is, is going to be. And you know, that will be a comment, frankly, that ranges right across every aspect of the Brexit process. But secondly, some of uh, our conclusions around this, the, the, the extent and nature of legislative action that will be required here will, and I think this is common sense, will depend on the nature of a future deal that is agreed between the UK and the EU. So we can do a certain amount of planning right now, but it's, imp it's impossible at this stage to be definitive about that. The, the length of time that we have to put these arrangements in place will also uh, undoubtedly be uh, influenced by the length and nature of any transition deal that is agreed. Um, We'll continue to work as closely as we can with the UK government to try to flesh out that picture and, and give as much clarity as quickly as is possible. In terms of our uh, work with the Parliament, um, both Mike Russell, the, the Brexit Minister, and Joe Fitzpatrick, Minister for Parliamentary Business, have been very clear. We want uh, Parliament to be uh, involved, fully involved in the scrutiny and development of that legislation. Uh, clearly, there are implications for all committees uh, in terms of the workload. Uh, it stands to reason, I think, that we will not need the same level of scrutiny for every single instrument that's likely to come forward because they will cover a whole range of disparate uh, areas. Um, and I, I know there has been an agreement, and I think it's a, an important one, to work with committees, particularly your committee, uh, to, to agree principles that will govern a level of scrutiny uh, that is appropriate depending on the significance of the particular instrument. So we will keep uh, very close in, in discussion with Parliament generally and with committees 
as the picture around this becomes clearer, which I would hope, uh, although it is possibly more hope than expectation, will be sooner rather than later. Yes. Yes. Briefly. Thank you. Um, yes, it's, it's important uh, that moving on that we, we agree be, between committees uh, and the government um, where the power lies, you know, who, who should be dealing with these instruments? Should it be government? Should it be committee? Uh, what should that level of scrutiny be? One idea which has been uh, put forward by the, the Lords actually is that, that we, we have a, a sifting committee to decide whether instruments should be uh, negative or affirmative. Um, Mr Russell appeared before our committee yesterday who was quite, quite up for looking at that. I wonder if that's your view as well. I hesitate to make any comment on whether Mr Russell is more sympathetic to ideas emanating from the House of Lords than, than I am. I will leave it there. Um, but generally speaking, I, I mean, to be serious, I, th I think that is a, a reasonable suggestion worthy of consideration in terms of uh, the process that we will agree in this Parliament for, for dealing with that work. It, your question alludes to this, there will be, I mean, clearly government has the responsibility for producing the drafts of, of legislation, but Parliament's role is an extensive one. And, you know, not just in, in scrutinising uh, the content, but in decisions, for example, is a particular instrument to be agreed by negative or affirmative procedure. These are fundamental decisions. In possibly a lot of areas, there will be uncontroversial decisions and, and the significance, every piece of legislation is significant, but some of what we're talking about here will be very technical and you know, tidy up uh, in nature. Yeah. Some of it might be more fundamental and substantive. So uh, I think you're right to point to the need, and there's certainly a willingness on the part of government to do this, to agree a, a process that allows us to, to guide this work in the future. So we'll continue to take forward these discussions. Okay. Jackie Bailey, followed by James Dorn and Jackie Bailey, convener, public audit and post-legislative scrutiny. Jackie, please. Thank you very much, convener. Um, First Minister, over the past few years, the Public Audit Committee um, have seen repeated problems with governance and financial management in some of our public bodies. Um, that's resulted in successive Audit Scotland reports, um, and indeed that's often accompanied by the staff involved leaving, so there's a lack of accountability. Recent examples that you'll be aware of include colleges and the Scottish Police Authority, where I understand the convener and the chief executive are standing down. I know that the Scottish Government is considering its severance policy, but would the First Minister agree that paying people substantial sums of money to leave an organisation can be seen by many as rewarding failure, and what assurances can she give that this will be minimised? Well, uh, firstly, just to deal with that latter part of your question first and, and be quite frank about it, yes, I do agree that uh, in circumstances, and obviously I'm talking generically here, not in relation to any particular example, but in, in circumstances where uh, somebody is leaving an organisation uh, where there has been controversy and there is a, a severance payment, uh, particularly where those severance payments are, are seen to be large, that can be perceived. It doesn't always mean that it is the case, but it can be perceived to be, as you put it, rewarding failure. And we don't want that perception. We certainly do not want that reality in our public sector. Uh, there are rules in place that govern severance arrangements. As you say, we are reviewing that whole area just now. And it's, you know, there are some you know, very important tests that have to be applied and, and public confidence is, is one of those. Uh, value for money um, and reasonableness are, are other ones. And I think it's, it's vital that they run through decision making there. I won't go into some of the issues that your committee has looked at, but there have been some instances, as you're, you're aware, that the government has expressed its own disquiet at some of, of these arrangements. Uh, more generally in terms of governance, which I think is, is an important area and one which um, right since my days as health secretary, it's one that I've been very interested in, is in, in terms of how we improve uh, governance and build the capacity in our public sector organisations. I think as you would concede, I think as your committee has noted, that the proportion of organisations that have been subject to critical audit reports is actually relatively small, uh, but nevertheless, when it happens, it is significant. Mm -hmm. um, the Scottish Government supports board members and chairs uh, through the, the government's onboard guidance um, and there are induction events. There's a whole range of work that we take forward or support to try to improve the capacity uh, and governance capability of, of boards because it, it stands to reason. It would know, be true of a government 
government anyway, it's true of public boards. It's the, the abilities uh, and the strength of decision making there that affects uh, issues right through the, the wider organisation. So these are important areas. It's important that the, the audit committee has a, a very close oversight of all of this, but also where there are Audit Scotland reports or where the audit committee is commenting on this, we take the opportunity to ensure that we're learning from these reports and applying that learning more widely across the public sector. Um, can I thank you very much for your comments. Um, let me take you back to the severance policy because I think that that is critical, um, particularly at a time of austerity when the general public might not understand when a small number of people get paid quite substantial amounts of money. I think in, in the case of the overall figure for last year, it may be in the millions. Um, so, you know, I think we need some clarity on that. In that context, you gave an undertaking, or somebody in the government gave an undertaking, to end the use of gagging clauses as part of severance agreements, yet they're still being used in the overwhelming number of cases. When can you see that practice ending? We did. Um, I'm, I'm happy to make sure that your committee has sight of this. I'm pretty sure it, it, it did. But we did make changes in terms of the use of, uh, if I can use a technical term, confidentiality agreements. Um, there, there will sometimes be occasions where appropriate confidentiality agreements uh, are, are put in place. Mm -hmm. uh, but one of, the thing, one of the concerns that was raised, uh, particularly in the context of the health service, uh, and it's a concern I absolutely uh, share, is any potential for confidentiality agreements uh, to stand in the way of whistleblowing, um, for example. Now, legally, that's not possible because of the statutory uh, rights that, that people have to uh, to whistleblowing. Uh, so we uh, made some changes around that just to, to put that absolutely beyond doubt. So I, I don't think any uh, government or any organisation anywhere would say that there is never any uh, circumstance in which a, a confidentiality agreement is appropriate, but it mustn't impinge on the ability of people in the public sector or people leaving the public sector to raise concerns or to speak out about issues they think are important and they should never stand in the way of the good governance of public sector organisations. But I will make sure your committee, I'm, I'm, as I say, I would fully expect that your committee uh, has uh, full sight of all of this, but I'll, I'll make sure that that's the case. Thank you. James Dornan, uh, followed by Bruce Crawford. James Dornan, Convener of Education and Skills. James, please. <coughs> Uh, First Minister, the Education and Skills Committee has indicated that it wishes to undertake pre-legislative scrutiny on the Education Reform Bill expected in the Parliament this parliamentary year. Does the FM, could the FM tell us how soon before the Bill is introduced the broad content and policy objectives of the Bill will be known and when will the Scottish Government be able to share these with the Committee? Um, I, I would hope we would be able to do that very soon. Um, firstly, I, I would welcome the committee's commitment to pre-legislative scrutiny. I, I, that's, a, a, I think, a really helpful uh, part of the, the process. Um, as uh, you will know, the uh, Education Review Next Steps document set out uh, the, the areas of reform that we're going to take forward. It should be said that uh, many aspects of our education reform agenda do not require legislation. Some of them are already underway, you know, standardised assessments, the Pupil Equity Fund, for example, which is, from my conversations with head teachers, doing a great deal to change the dynamic uh, of decision making within education. But those aspects that do require legislation will uh, be included in the education bill that is uh, due to be published before the summer recess next year. I think from memory, it's scheduled for introduction in June uh, of next year. Uh, we intend to consult on the, the elements of that bill shortly, and so we will make sure that the committee has sight of the consultation uh, document uh, very soon, and, and I would hope that would be uh, before uh, too much further time has elapsed. Uh, I think we've been very clear of some of the main elements of the bill. You know, it will provide for the head teachers charter, for example, it will uh, include the legislative underpinning of the new regional improvement collaboratives. It will also have provisions to improve parental involvement in education. So th those are some of the key uh, areas that the legislation will cover, uh, but the consultation will obviously go into more detail. And that consultation document, I think, will be very helpful to the committee in guiding that process of pre-legislative scrutiny. Thank you for that answer. You, you mentioned the collaboratives and a lot of the debate has been around the roles of councils and collaboratives, etc. But can you explain to me what you consider will be the practical help the reforms will give for teachers and kids within the classroom? Well, I think not, not just the, the reforms that we take forward legislatively, but the reforms generally, uh, to, to kind of simplify and summarise, it is about uh, empowering 
schools and those working in the front line of education, head teachers and teachers and where appropriate parents and, and young people themselves. So it's about shifting uh, not just powers but responsibilities as far as possible to the level of schools. That's backed up by lots of evidence that say that is one of the most important things you can do in terms of driving an improvement agenda. So the Pupil Equity Fund is a really important part of that because it, you know, it, it gives head teachers more control over their own budget and, and that is perhaps one of the most important drivers and then uh, driving the decisions in, in a school. Uh, but again, the evidence and much of the evidence that comes from our uh, International Council of Advisors here is that we need to, you know, having that sort of empowerment of schools is not just a free for all, it needs to be informed by the best quality improvement evidence and advice and that's where the regional improvement collaboratives come in, the best advice on uh, educational uh, practice uh, and uh, making sure that is provided in a, a coherent and consistent way. But the, the shift to the presumption that decisions are taken at school level is the key driver of all of the reforms that we're taking forward. Okay, thank you. Bruce Crawford to be followed by Margaret Mitchell. Bruce Crawford, Convener of Finance and Constitution. Bruce, please. Thanks, President Officer. First Minister, the process of intergovernmental discussions on the EU withdrawal bill are clearly going to be critical to any prospect of the Scottish Government recommending legislative consent on the bill. But therefore, I think quite helpful if you could provide an update on the state of negotiations um, with the UK Government on the bill and where you believe any progress might have been made since the meeting of the GMCEN on the 16th of October. In particular, I was interested to note from the principles agreed at that meeting that any, that the, any frameworks will be expected to respect the devolution settlement. Now, I think it was quite useful that the UK government signed up to that, but principles are one thing. So do you believe, though, that the principles can be adhered to if the Clause 11 of the EU withdrawal bill remains as it's currently drafted? Well, Clause 11 is is unacceptable to the Scottish Government in, in all circumstances. Um, I mean, th this is an area that's hugely and, and quite fundamentally important here, although it can appear very dry and technical. Uh, we have never, ever queried uh, or, or taken issue at all with the notion that post-Brexit there will be a requirement for uh, UK-wide framework agreements in certain areas. I mean, you know, even if Scotland was an independent country, given the, the nature of the geography and the trading relationships across the UK, you know, those sort of cross-border arrangements in some instances will be not just appropriate, but desirable. So we have no issue with that at all. Uh, the issue is, how do they come into being? And our view is that where they impinge on devolved responsibilities, they must come into being through agreement, not through imposition. Now, the GMC uh, earlier this month did make some progress there. As you say, it agreed a set of principles which have been published, uh, which will govern the, the discussions we have about the development of potential frameworks. And one of the principles was respect for the devolution settlement. So I, you know, I welcome that progress. It possibly beggars belief that it's taken us so long to get to a point where respect for devolution is actually recognised as one of the key principles. Uh, the problem... As long as Clause 11 is there, though, is that, you know, that is rhetoric. It might be quite helpful rhetoric, but the reality of Clause 11 is that it gives the UK government the power of imposition, effectively. And it turns the, the, the underpinning principle of this parliament on its head. You know, the Scotland Act, the, the genius principle uh, of, of Donald Dewar back in the the, the pre-devolution days, that everything is devolved unless it's explicitly reserved, is actually flipped and, and becomes uh, the reverse of that. So everything is r reserved unless the UK government decides they want to devolve it in areas that actually are already devolved. That's unacceptable to us. So notwithstanding what happens with these uh, discussions, we will not agree or we will not recommend to this parliament legislative consent for a bill that has that Clause 11 in its current form. Uh, it's the same position as the Welsh Government is taking. Um, you know, we've even got organisations, and I noticed yesterday the Scottish Fishermen's Federation, an organisation that was uh, more in, in favour of leaving the EU than, uh, than remaining within it, is, is saying that that bill, uh, without amendment, threatens the, the ability of this Parliament to, to take decisions in devolved areas. Uh, so I hope these discussions that... Uh, we're continued at the GMC, continue positively. We will certainly do our best to make sure that they do. But notwithstanding that, we will not agree to a bill that has that Clause 11 in it. But you, First Minister, I, I agree it was useful that the, the UK government 
recognise the, the, you know, the, the, the devolution settlement and the, the principles behind it. The principle is one thing, actions are another. Uh, and previously, there has been a series of papers produced by the, the UK government um, where there had been no involvement for the, for the devolved governments, despite the fact that some of these areas were in the papers were in devolved areas. It would be interesting to see, are they following through in that respect, in terms of the principles they've just agreed, as far as the papers that are now being produced by them, and has there been any better dialogue between the Scottish and UK governments in that regard? Well, the papers um, you know, have, have not respected in any way, shape or form uh, the kind of good working arrangements you would want to see uh, in any uh, sense, not even just in a Brexit sense, between the Scottish and UK governments. I think in one occasion, if memory serves me correctly, we got three days working notice of, of the publication. Normally with these papers, we've had, uh, through the kind of normal official channels, had a day's notice of publication. Um, but it's not the length of notice, it's whether we've had any ability in areas that impinge heavily, I mean, on justice, for example, a devolved area, we've had no opportunity to uh, contribute to the development of these papers, to influence the content of them, even to offer, you know, views on, on the factual content of them. And, and that's just, you know, it's, it's not just unacceptable from, you know, the, the point of view of the sort of respect for, for different governments. It's not a good way of proceeding in terms of getting the best possible outcome. Um, I, in response to Joe McAlpine's question, I refer to the suggestions that, uh, as well as these papers, the government, UK government has uh, a range of uh, studies looking at the, the impact of Brexit. Now, the suggestion is those are sectoral studies and also uh, perhaps a, a study that looks specifically at the impact of Brexit in Scotland. And, you know, I just caught some of David Davis at a Westminster committee this morning where apparently saying it would not be in the national interest to publish these. Well, you know, it might not be in the interest of the UK government to publish these. It's certainly in the national interest to publish them. Um, so there is a, a lack of willingness to share information and to allow the Scottish government or indeed the, the other devolved administrations uh, to, to properly influence this work. And I just don't think that is acceptable either from uh, the, the the point of view you're putting forward about respect for devolution or for, from the, the, the interest of actually getting the best possible outcomes to these discussions. Thank you. Thank you. I call Margaret Mitchell, followed by Sandra White. Margaret Mitchell, Convener of Justice. Margaret, please. First Minister, can I ask if you consider it acceptable that the Justice Committee is, is currently looking at three different bills, all at different stages, with a fourth on the way, and that over the years, um, there's been a, a justifiable concern, which I'd be interested to know if she shared, that the committee is becoming merely a legislative machine for government bills. Well, I mean, that, you're right in the sense that I think when the presiding officer here was in, in your position, it was a, a concern she raised frequently. Um, she probably raised it more directly with me on occasion than, than you did. You know, I... We have to, and we do, and, and I hope all conveners, even if they don't always like the outcome of these discussions, accept that the government works very hard with committees to try to make sure we phase our legislative programme in a way that takes account of the, the, the workload of, of different committees. Uh, but we have, a, you know, we have a big, ambitious legislative programme, and, and we want to, to make progress with that. You know, I, frequently, the government, I think, Possibly, I know we're not in a party political forum here, but members of your own party have criticised the government for not legislating enough. Other times we get criticised for legislating too much. So we have to get that balance right. The reason we do phase, we don't, we, we announce a, a legislative programme in September, but you know, as I was just saying to James Dornan, it will be next June before the education bill is introduced, because we have to phase that to allow Parliament and committees to properly give that scrutiny. So look, I, I don't have the I don't have the magic answer to this. We have, you know, there is a particularly heavy workload for the Justice Committee because of the, the, the priorities we've set out in the programme for government. I don't have the magic answer to this, except we will continue to try to work as closely with committees to uh, phase and manage that workload uh, as, as best we possibly can. Well, can I put it another way, First Minister? What consideration, when you're looking at your work programme, are you giving not just to the scrutiny of bills, but to the other functions that the committees are supposed to be carrying out, carrying out their own inquiries, post-legislative scrutiny? If we continue to pass more and more legislation without doing practically any post-legislative scrutiny, 
That isn't effective government, it's not effective legislation. And also, there's very little um, opportunity for committees to actually instigate legislation because we, as a committee representing people, feel this is um, legislation that should be brought forward and we are the people's voice to do that. Well, the, f the first consideration we give when we decide a legislative programme is what is the need for legislation. And, you know, the, the bills before your committee just now are a bill on domestic abuse, uh, a bill on or the, the, that will be forthcoming management of offenders, vulnerable witnesses and, and pre-recorded evidence, a bill on damages, uh, another bill on civil litigation. Now, I'm not sure there's anybody telling me that any of these pieces of legislation are not required. So the, the first question we ask is, what's the purpose of a piece of legislation? Uh, and, and we take it from there. So I would, I would sit here and argue very, very strongly that every bill that we are proposing to the Parliament is a bill that has a purpose. Uh, there may be disagreements on the contents of these bills, but unless you're telling me any of these particular bills are not necessary, then the question cannot be we just don't do them. It has to be how do we properly manage uh, that, that workload. Um, and we will continue to engage in, in those discussions. But, you know, as I say, I often, and I'm sure I was as unfair on governments when I was in opposition, I'm absolutely convinced I was, but, you know, you often, as a government, you can't win because we have been over, uh, certainly over recent months, the accusation has been we haven't legislated enough. Well, you know, we've now got, you know, by summer recess next uh, Next year, I think there will be, in the first two years of this parliamentary term, by then we will pass 20 pieces of legislation. And I think all of them are, are necessary pieces of, of legislation. You're right, though. Legislation is not the sum total of what governments or parliaments do. So I agree with you. It's important that committees have the, the space and the time to do inquiries into other things as well. And to be fair to the Justice Committee, not just in recent times, but over the lifetime of this Parliament, I think uh, have been uh, an exemplar committee often in, in doing that. So as I said earlier, I don't have the magic answer to this, but we will continue to engage uh, positively with committees to try to manage that workload uh, as best we can. Sandra White, followed by Neil Finlay. Uh, Sandra White, Convener of Social Security. Sandra, please. Thank you very much, Convener. And uh, First Minister, uh, my committee is actually at the moment scrutinising the largest piece of legislation to go through the Scottish Parliament, the Social Security Bill and obviously the Child Poverty Bill, uh, two very important bills which I think are foremost in most people's uh, minds. Uh, one of the areas which has been raised with us on numerous occasions from witnesses and also from committee members is uh, citizens' income. Um, and I know that the Scottish Government uh, is actually looking at a feasibility study in regards to this. And obviously others, I think the press as well, have been looking at this as well. And I'm sure you can comment on that, First Minister, if you wish. But can the First Minister give us details uh, of the timescale and scope of the study, the feasibility study into that? And where are the evidence that we have already gathered in the Social Security Committee would be actually welcome, not so much welcome, but be included in the feasibility study? Well, the, the feasibility work is... Uh, I won't surprise you to hear this, given uh, we announced it in the Programme for Government. It's at a, a fairly early stage. There are right now uh, four local authorities that have indicated an interest in piloting citizens' basic income, and I believe all four of them have the approval of their, their councils uh, to develop feasibility plans to do so. Uh, so the four councils are Fife, North Ayrshire, Edinburgh and Glasgow. So the funding that I announced in the programme for government is uh, it's going to be available for the next two financial years and it will be funding to support those councils to, uh, I guess, scope out the research design to clarify what particular aspects of citizens' income they want to test and what the cost of doing that would be. At that stage, we'll have further discussions and take further decisions about what funding uh, we may make available for the actual pilots themselves. Uh, I think all of the, the experts looking at this, the, the pilot authorities themselves, will consider that that sort of two-year period to make sure they get the scoping and the design of these pilots right is is appropriate. Um, I think the other point to make here is that we want to have the... Uh, the, the collaboration in anything that's taken forward here with, uh, of the DWP. Um, yeah, I, I said this openly when we published the programme for government. Uh, you know, citizens' basic income uh, would be replacing some of, uh, if not all, of the sort of benefits that uh, people currently get. So uh, we would need to make sure that we had that uh, cooperation and over time 
see this parliament take on more responsibility. Um, I think it's important and, and interesting work to do. I mean, I, I've been quite frank about it. I, I can't sit here and tell parliament right now that at the end of this process, anybody will decide that a citizen's income is, is the feasible, practical or desirable thing to do. But as I, I think uh, Adam Tomp Tompkins in your committee himself said, is given the, the challenges we face over the next few years, an economy that's changing rapidly, uh, you know, the, the, the challenges uh, with uh, digitalisation of, of the economy, uh, then it's right to, to look perhaps quite fundamentally at how a social safety net uh, and, uh, you know, basic welfare system works in a way that empowers people. So I'm, you know, absolutely of the view this is good and right to do, and it will be interesting to see where this work leads us over the next few years. Mm -hmm. And, and sorry, lastly, you asked me about the social security evidence, of course. I mean, I think that evidence has been helpful and will no doubt help to inform the work that's done. Um, thank you. Just, just a, a, a small uh, supplementary. So it's two years in and then it could be another three to four years, depending on what's happening. But you mentioned the fact about Mr Tompkins, who's obviously a member of the committee, who has changed his mind, similar to a number of so-called experts. Do you have any comment on that? I know that you've said yourself that it's a feasibility study that, uh, you know, you're open-minded what happens, but Mr Tompkins was for and he's now against, and so as others as well. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think on something like this, I mean, governments, not, not just in Scotland, but, you know, worldwide, it's a bit like the legislation point. You get criticised for not being prepared to do this sort of bold, original thinking about things that, you know, are long-term uh, and may or may not ever come to fruition. And then when you do, I mean, I, you know, I saw a headline, I can't remember what paper was, it was in the other day, it's like Sturgeon's citizens' income to cost, whatever. You know, this is something we've committed to look at because there's a lot of, I think, legitimate interest in this. So I, I think governments should be prepared to look at things uh, in an open-minded way. And, you know, lots of people, myself included, will come at these discussions with preconceived ideas about whether something's workable or desirable. But sometimes the both the, the biggest challenge in politics, but the biggest imperative, particularly given the times we live in just now, is to open your mind to new thinking and new ideas. And this is one example of that. So I would encourage everybody, no matter their preconceived ideas on whatever side of this debate, is to keep an open mind. And let's see the, the work that these local authorities are going to take forward, supported by the Scottish Government, might throw up some interesting findings for us that, that we might, who knows, perish the thought, manage to build a consensus round in the years to come. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Neil Finlay, followed by Bob Doris. Neil Finlay, Convener of Health and Sport. Neil, please. Uh, thanks. According to the Scottish Government website, the review of NHS targets by Sir Harry Burns was due to be published in 2016-17, then spring 17, and we're now rapidly approaching Christmas and we'll be into 2018. Um, where's the report? I think, the, if memory serves me correctly, the, the Health Secretary has recently written to your committee regarding uh, timescales indicating that it will be published uh, shortly. Uh, the, uh, as, as I think anybody would accept in work like this, Sir Harry, and I can't think, having worked with Sir Harry uh, very closely now as health secretary, I can't think of anybody better to take forward this work. It's important work. It, it will be sensitive work because we all know the importance of targets in the health service, but we also know the challenges uh, that the health service faces in future. So that work's looking at uh, key principles uh, and questions about how we use targets and indicators and uh, wider analysis to drive improvement in the health service. So uh, we haven't set a date yet uh, for the publication of it, but it will be published uh, soon and the health secretary will keep your committee fully advised. Is it, uh, can I ask if the report has been... Has it been across your desk in the I haven't seen the report, no. Is it on the Cabinet Secretary's uh, Not desk? as far as I'm aware, no. It, is it likely to be seen uh, see the light of day this year? I would, uh, I would hope so. I'm, I'm not going to sit here and give you a, an absolute guarantee on that because we don't have a date for publication yet. So I'll, I'll be frank with you. That, but I, I would certainly hope so. This is work that is important to the government. It's again, you know, I, I'm probably being a bit optimistic here in what I'm about to say, but notwithstanding the political differences that exist, I hope this is the kind of work, given the 
the author of this report that we can try and build a bit of consensus around in terms of the way forward because it will be really important to the, the development of the reform work that we are taking forward in the NHS. I know uh, tomorrow we'll see the, the publication of Audit Scotland's uh, annual report in the NHS and I'm sure, as there always is, there'll be uh, challenging messages in that for all of us about the need to reform how we deliver health care in, in future. So this is an important contribution to that. I think it's, it's right to allow Sir Harry to uh, complete that report publish that report, your committee and parliament as a whole will want to scrutinise it. But it is the kind of area where we should be, I, I think, striving to see if we can find some agreement about the best way forward. I understand that will be important to the government, but it will be more important to the patients and staff in the, the NHS. But we look forward to that coming forward very soon indeed, given the length of time it has taken. Um, mental health is, a, is an area of um, big concern for the Health and Sport Committee. Uh, last year, 7,000 young people failed to get the mental health support they needed. We find, find that one in five 16 to 24 year olds are reporting self harm, and suicide is the second most common uh, cause of death for 16 to 19 year olds. Um, why are we failing so many young people who desperately need help for mental health support? Well, this is, I think, of, of many really important issues that uh, are involved in the whole health area. This is probably the most important one. Um, you know, I, I may quibble with some of your characterisations here, but I don't, I don't quibble with the fundamental premise of your question. Um, we are seeing, uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, massively increasing demand for mental health services, and, and that's not unique to Scotland. I think that's a, a phenomenon across the, the Western world. Um, some of that is down to uh, pressures that exist in the lives of young people that perhaps didn't when we were growing up. Uh, but some of it is down to the reducing stigma around mental health, which is a positive thing. People feel more able to come forward for help. Uh, that puts a massive responsibility on the shoulders of governments and, and health services to meet that demand. And we are in the process of uh, a reform of mental health services, increasing investment in mental health services significantly, reforming how those services are delivered, taking uh, forward proposals, some of which have come from your own party, about how we get support for mental health into to schools and other settings uh, to try to have more of a focus on prevention. So this is uh, work that is ongoing across a whole range of, of different areas. We're seeing progress uh, in waiting times, for example. It's not as fast as we would want it to be, uh, but we are seeing increased investment, increased numbers of people working. We've seen some health boards in particular uh, have great success in transforming the, the performance of their services. Um, you know, in, in terms of, you, you mentioned suicide, the, 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 the trend for suicides, thankfully, is, is downward, but as long as there is one young person taking their own life, then we've got much, much more work to do. So, you know, speaking personally, as well as speaking as, as I am here as, as First Minister, uh, there is probably no more important area of health policy over you know, the, the next few years than mental health generally, and in particular, mental health for younger people. Thank you. It's Bob Doris, we followed by Graham Day. Bob Doris is convener of local government and communities. Bob, please. Uh, First Minister, a uh, housing first approach for rough sleepers offers a permanent tenancy along with significant additional support. Our committee witnessed the success of using housing first firsthand in Finland Recently, otherwise, other, otherwise vulnerable individuals navigate a journey from rough sleeping to emergency accommodation to hostels and on to temporary furnished accommodation. Finally, they might might secure a permanent tenancy. It's a journey that many never complete. Does the First Minister agree with the underpinning principles behind Housing First? And how actively is the Scottish Government considering upscaling Housing First here in Scotland? Um, I do agree with the underpinning principles of Housing First because it's, it, it is about uh, responding very quickly to initial need, but it's also about looking at how a package of support is put around somebody who is homeless and, and needing accommodation. And, and one of the things I think we all recognise is that tackling homelessness and rough sleeping is, of course, it is first and foremost about providing accommodation for people, but just providing accommodation is of, often not sufficient. It's the uh, the mental health support, the addiction support, the, the wider social support that you put around people that is fundamental to whether or not somebody can sustain a tenancy. Uh, housing First is already being used in certain parts of Scotland with quite significant success, so it's one area that I'm very interested uh, to see us uh, and local authorities extend their use of. Um, as you know, we 
uh, announced the establishment of the Homelessness and Rough Sleeping uh, Task Force in the programme for government. It's already up and uh, running. Uh, John uh, Sparks, the Chair of Crisis, uh, is chairing uh, that for us and it has already met, uh, looking at a range of ways in which we, we tackle homelessness and rough sleeping. It's got a immediate focus on this winter and how we, we reduce uh, the, the risk that people are facing this winter. Um, so you know, we will be driven largely by the recommendations that come from this task force. We've also set up the new fund to back it, but I have a you know, significant expectation that housing first and sort of innovative models like that will be quite central to the, the recommendations that are made. Uh, our committee is currently conducting an inquiry into homelessness and Turning Point, one of the organisations conducting a Housing First model at the moment, gave witnesses uh, evidence this morning to our committee, but it's still relatively small scale. Any significant upscaling of Housing First would need significant additional support and it would certainly an increased workforce. The Scottish Government has identified £10 million per annum for an ending homelessness together fund and the initiative and £20 million per annum for supporting uh, those with drug and alcohol addictions most key, and key, key groups at risk of homelessness. I'm just wondering uh, whether Housing First might be a good use of some of, of those funds and whether actually we have to look a bit more at integrated budgets. We've got health and social care integration, but housing is not quite there. If we have to look a bit more innovatively about using different pots of cash about a coordinated approach to tackling homelessness and rough sleeping. Firstly, the, the two additional sources of uh, revenue that you've mentioned there that I announced in the programme for government may well be um, sources of funding to support housing first approaches and I certainly uh, would have uh, be very open to seeing that kind of money uh, used there. Um, but your point about integration is more fundamental. Often uh, tackling homelessness, it, it will be interventions of social work uh, more broadly of, of the health service that will determine whether or not not just that somebody can be removed from homelessness but sustain tenancies in the longer term. So integration of budgets is the direction of travel that we're on. You've mentioned health and social care over time. I'm a, a great uh, enthusiast for seeing us integrate much more of the public funding that's available because I think without being glib about it, you know, at the end of the day, the quantum of resources is important, but you, you tend to get more value out of money the more integrated and joined up the approach to using it is. Um, and certainly as, as the work of the Homelessness Task Force continues, we will be looking you know, at what additional resource is required to support its recommendations, but where that resource comes from and, and how we get best use of what we're already investing. Thank you. Graham Day, followed by Edward Mountain. Uh, Graham Day, Convener of Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform. Graham, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, First Minister, whatever the eventual ambition of the forthcoming climate bill, whether it aims for the 90% reduction or the 100% that some are calling for, it will require some significant changes in policy and behaviour of the targets to be met. Can I ask what you believe is going to be needed and how the Scottish Government will seek to deliver this? And given the cross-portfolio nature of what's going to be entailed, what work's going on to ensure that all Cabinet Secretaries and Ministers become, and at all times are, climate change Cabinet Secretaries and Ministers? Well, in I mean, you're right about the, the issue at the heart of uh, the, one of the, the key decisions we've got to make in terms of the, the finalisation of the, the climate change bill. Uh, the, the proposal for consultation is for a 90% emissions reduction by 2050. There are a number of organisations who want us immediately to set a target of net zero. Um, and in summary, that comes down to do we do now what there is a, an evidence path to and leave flexibility to go further, uh, or do we right now commit to something even although we don't have the clear evidence path towards it and that's something obviously the government will think very carefully about i mean even the 90 percent though is is massively ambitious and you know in terms of the spending uh, that will take uh, to, to deliver that over that kind of long uh, time period uh, is significant uh, so it's it's definitely uh, an ambitious target but we will we'll continue to consider that your point about the, the how the government approaches this in a sort of all government way is important no we obviously have a a cabinet secretary responsible for climate change but she cannot deliver this uh, on her own the, the efforts of every part of government are essential the 
I suppose the most important forum here is the, the Cabinet Subcommittee on Climate Change. That's the, the place within government where we ensure that the action needed to tackle climate change is, is you know, hardwired into every area of government policy. So over the past year, the focus of the subcommittee has been overseeing uh, the development and the production of the Climate Change Plan, which is the plan to deliver our current uh, targets. Um, and that has meant... Uh, you know, very, very uh, tangibly that the ministers have had to work together to make sure not only that the activity within their own portfolios contributes to meeting those targets, but also that what every individual minister is doing is adding up to more than the sum of its parts. So that's a, an imp I know, you know, that's an important discipline on government and our discussions around the cabinet table um, on climate change would reflect the fact that there is a real recognition that it is a cross-government challenge. Okay, thank you. Following on for that, in, in terms of really monitoring de delivery on climate uh, targets and holding all the relevant areas of government to account, there's a proposal come forward from Friends of the Earth Scotland uh, that instead of having the Environment Secretary report to Parliament twice a year on climate change, as currently happens, we use a new bill to give the June statement a statutory underpinning and move all the functions covered by the October statement to then. We would then have the existing October ministerial a statement replaced by a series of statements and reports that focus on explaining individual sectors progress and, and policy implementation. So these would cover uh, say ele the electricity sector, low carbon buildings, land use and, and agriculture and then transport and they'd be delivered by the relevant ministers. I just wonder how you as the First Minister view that proposal. Um, I, I, look, I'm open-minded to, to proposals of that nature. That's not to say I think we'll definitely take it forward, but I, I will give a, a commitment to, to look at it and, and see whether we think there is, is merit there. Uh, I know the Environment Secretary is due to make uh, a statement over uh, the next couple of weeks on uh, our performance. I suppose I think it's important to have a person in Cabinet who is accountable to Parliament and, and to the country more widely for our performance around climate change, absolutely recognising that in order for us to perform against our targets, we need everybody across government to be doing uh, and, and playing their part. Uh, there may well be a merit in having individual Cabinet secretaries reporting on the actions within their own portfolio. I suppose if, if I was to express any sort of scepticism about that, it... it, it counterintuitively may mean that we lead to more of a kind of silo approach to this rather than everybody feeding in through the cabinet subcommittee into the, the report that the uh, relevant cabinet secretary is, is required to give. So that, that would be, I suppose, my, my, my point of scepticism, but I've just been, uh, in response to another question, making a plea for open-mindedness on these things. So I will be open-minded and, and uh, commit to having a look at the Friends of the Earth proposal. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Edward Mountain, to follow by Joanne Lamont. Edward Mountain, Convener of Rural Economy and Connectivity. Edward, please. Thank you, Convener. Uh, First Minister, when taking evidence on the Island Bill, the committee's been out to Mull, Orkney and the Western Isles and taken various other evidence sessions. And it's clear that islands with councils and councils with islands have different views. Can you uh, give both of those groups the reassurance that every island will be treated differently and considered within the plan and that there, there will be a plan for each island uh, within the overall plan that's proposed in the bill? Well, firstly, uh, the Islands Bill has generally been very warmly welcomed. I absolutely take the point that there will be different views from different islands given their differing uh, circumstances. Um, and I think it's important. So the short answer to your question is yes, we will make sure we take account of the needs of different islands because no two islands are the same. I'm going to uh, stop myself before I get into a discussion about the definition of an island. Uh, but different islands, uh, it stands to reason, it's a statement of the obvious, have different needs and requirements and, and different priorities. Uh, so that has to be reflected uh, in, in the plan and in the bill generally. Obviously, as you say, your committee still uh, has been taken evidence that the bill is still in process. So we will seek to listen to and incorporate these different views as best we can. Bridging the gap then onto the next question, as you're not prepared to, to talk about the bridging, if I could say on the Islands Bill, it's clear that people believe that future island proofing legislation might require to be financed. And will, is that formed part of your thought process when drawing up the, the legislation? Well, in my... Uh 
now fairly extensive speed, period of government, everything that government does has requires to be financed in some way uh, or other. So uh, yes, I mean, I, I think that is is a, a reasonable statement that if you're going to island proof every piece of legislation, there will be at times financial uh, consequences from doing that. But obviously, uh, when we publish bills, we produce a financial memorandum uh, in terms of the financial impact of the bill itself. But in terms of embedding that, it's a bit similar to the climate change discussion in taking forward an approach that is about island proofing, there will be financial uh, consequences of that occur from time to time, and they will be considered in the normal budgetary processes that government takes forward from year to year. Okay, and the final part is that the bill does not mention in any form and doesn't deal with uninhabited islands. There's a question of whether that shows a lack of ambition for those islands, and should they be included within the bill, and I wondered what your views on that were. Um, I, I certainly will uh, take that away and, and we will consider that. If it has come up in uh, the, the evidence so far, it would be something we would consider in the normal course of events uh, when, when considering amendments at a later stage of the bill process. Um, I absolutely think part of our, a, a core part of our thinking around support for and, and development of islands should be about how we uh, re-inhabit uh, or, or, or increase the population of, of islands, not necessarily ones that are currently uninhabited. I recently announced the, the government's approval for uh, community buyout of, of Ulva, for example. It's not an uninhabited island, I, I hasten to add, but it's, it's an island where I think they recognise that taking similar to egg, taking it into public ownership would allow them to do things that would encourage more people to come and, and live there. So the sort of repopulation of our island communities, I think, should be a core part of this. Um, and, you know, in terms of the, the position for uninhabited islands, uh, I'll certainly take that away and see whether there's more we need to do on the face of the bill to give greater recognition to that as a, a policy priority. Thank you, First Minister. Now fretting about the definition of an island, I'm going to have to find out how big it has to be. Uh, Joanne Lamont, to be followed by Gordon Lindhurst. Joanne Lamont, convener of public petitions. Joanne, please. I'm not going to be drawn into a discussion on what forms an island, but I can tell you, <laughs> if you want, which one I think is the best of the lot of them. But, um, 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 I think everybody knows the Public Petitions Committee. It's kind of difficult to think about what would be um, an appropriate question, given that the committee itself reflects the priorities of the people of Scotland to some extent, whether it's trade unions, community groups, national organisations, all sorts of groups will bring um, petitions to uh, the committee and, and often this, the direct experience of individual, and these can often be the most powerful petitions where people bring the consequence of something that's happened to them and, and want uh, policy change as a consequence. So in reflecting on what we've been doing, one of the things that does come out is the extent to which health issues emerge out of the Public Petitions Committee. 25% of all petitions this session have been on health. They've been lodged this session. 39% of the petitions that have been carried over from the last session um, would broadly be around health questions. And there are a number of features of those petitions which I think tell us something about interest in what your views are on this. They're very often about a lack of awareness of particular conditions. They're about lack of access to treatments that are not seen to be mainstream or a sense that you get access in one place and not in another. But underpinning a lot of it, um, the most obvious example, I think, would be the MESH scandal. Are people feeling that they've not been believed in the system when they present themselves and don't feel that they're listened to? And I wonder, um, in your programme of government, when you talk about the action to improve health, what do you think or what, what are your plans around those very specific those general, sorry, experiences, these truths about the health service, which is that, you know, you're not believed and you don't feel as if you're, that you're heard when you're raising concerns about the treatment you've been given? Well, I, firstly, I, I, I sort of was smiling when you said it's, it's difficult, given the range of things you look at in the Petitions Committee, to know what to ask. It's, it's equally difficult to know what to prepare for in, in advance. Um, but that is, I think, a really positive reflection of the, the, the nature of the work that the Public Petitions Committee does. Um, in terms of, and there is a preponderance of, of health issues raised, and you know, that's not surprising to me because health is so often impinging uh, on you know, the most personal, sensitive experiences that people will have. When I was health secretary, I found uh, the, the public petitions process invaluable often in 
shining a light on some of the issues that sometimes because they might only affect a very small number of people that in, in the sort of routine uh, business of the, the portfolio you wouldn't necessarily be aware of. Um, so I think there is a duty on government and, and it's very important for government to uh, look very closely not just at the individual petitions that are coming forward but at the pattern um, of, of cases uh, and issues that are coming forward and, and we try to do that. Um, with, with health in particular, I think one of the, so I'm trying not to uh, go off at a tangent here, but one of the most difficult things often in health to deal with are very rare conditions. Um, and this often it surfaces in access to drugs, but it's, it's wider than that. And often it's because they are rare and only a few people suffer from them. So the awareness, not even of the general public, but often of the, the clinical community is low. Uh, and so I think, again, the Public Petitions Committee has a really important role in trying to be part of a process of raising awareness. And I know there have been cases of uh, public petitions that have led to a change of policy on the government's part in terms of uh, you know, leading to, to renewed guidance or, or campaigns to raise awareness of conditions that previously we hadn't done uh, as, as much as we should have done around. Um, I think there is a, a sense, and again, it, it will sometimes be perception rather than reality, that, that people in the, the bureaucracy of the health service are not heard or listened to or believed uh, as much as they, they should be. So again, I think this is an area where the Petitions Committee... I, you know, I wish it didn't have to be that people brought petitions on these things, but nevertheless, that mean, doesn't mean that it's not an important role. O on MESH, which has been, you know, for the women concerned, an incredibly painful uh, experience that they've gone through. But that whole process has led to change. Uh, you know, the, the number of, of MESH procedures uh, since the suspension of, of MESH was uh, put forward by the, the chief medical officer have, have r radically reduced, I think, by over 90%. Uh, and there's a lot now of understanding uh, of that which will lead to change in terms of the practice and the, the, the information and involvement of patients. Now, that's been a very painful experience for the women concerned, that the pain they've gone through uh, compounded by, you know, having to, to do what they've done to, to draw attention to that. So, you know, these are... I wish we never had a situation where people felt that they have to do that, but I do think the public petitions process is an invaluable part of making sure we learn those lessons, um, particularly in the areas that don't get as much attention as they should, and make sure that those lessons are applied. I would say on the, on the mesh question very gently to you, I mean, I think that anybody that sits through the sessions, the power and the, and the anger and distress that comes from the gallery, from the women who have suffered, is just... I mean, the impact on, on the committee members has been immense. And I'm not sure, I hear what you say, I'm not sure that people feel there's been that, that kind of change. And if you want to bring your authority to looking further at that, that would be absolutely wonderful. I think there's an issue about, I agree with you about the question of prevalence. And people have said, people don't pay attention to me because there's only a very few of us. But there's also, I think, you, you'll, you'll know the chief medical officers talked about realistic medicine and that there should be a partnership. So you, you, you as a patient have the right to be heard and right to be your treatment to be to get, to delivered together. And yet what comes out of the Public Petitions Committee is not just about training or awareness of conditions, it is a presumption still that actually if you're bringing something to the table, you want to, you're not, it's not an equal relationship. I'm sure there's very good practice, but I wonder what you think you as a government can do to move that on, not just to give GPs and doctors better knowledge and awareness, but actually shifting that relationship when people come and say, I've got a grave concern about this, I don't think you're aware of the way in which this is playing out for me and others like me. There's a whole range of things that, that government needs to do from uh, you know, awareness campaigns and, and guidance around specific conditions uh, through to you know, the changes we've made over the years to the complaints process and the advocacy that uh, is available for patients who, who want to take a, a complaint or an issue through the health service. I, you know, I know from my own constituency caseload that that still um, is not perfect and you know, we need to continue to improve that as, as much as we can, learning where we need to from, from real patient experience. The whole area of realistic medicine is, is one of the most important things we're doing right now in terms of, of reforming the whole way that the health service works, in, in my opinion. But it's, it's challenging for all of us. And it's, it, it's not, I would again you know, put back to you, 
again, gently, it's not just government. Government's got a prime responsibility here, but for all of us as politicians, because and I'm, I'm not talking about any particular condition here, or, but there will be times where a particular drug or a particular treatment that a patient absolutely understandably thinks that they, they should get for a particular condition is, is perhaps not the best thing in terms of the, the overall treatment of, of the condition or the overall uh, approach to medicine. And, and these are difficult decisions, uh, or difficult debates rather, because the decisions should always be clinical ones, but they are difficult debates for, for all of us. And given the the, the, the trends in health that we know are underway, not just in Scotland, but globally right now, I think these are debates that are increasingly important for all of us to have in a very constructive way. Now, going back to the petitions committee, uh, you know, often where that will be helpful is in allowing those individual experiences to be aired, but also taking the individual experience and applying that uh, to change uh, in policy. Um, and on the, on the Met, I don't want to go into the mesh uh, issue in, in detail, unless you want me to, unless we've got time to. But I would say, and say this absolute sincerity, I've paid very close attention to the, the, the sessions that your committee's had and the wider issue around this. And I am in no doubt about uh, the very uh, legitimate and justifiable anger that, that women feel here. Um, the review that was undertaken has led to changes, the, the, the num just on a, a sheer numbers basis in terms of the, the reduction in the number of, of mesh procedures taking place demonstrates that there is that change, but it is a, an example, an unfortunate example of, of some of the wider issues you're talking about here, about the need for patient experience to be listened to uh, and heard and, and believed in a way that unfortunately doesn't always happen in the health service. Uh, I've let that run a bit longer. It's a Thank very you. important exchange. I'm not saying they weren't all important, but I think in particular. Uh, Gordon Lindhurst, to be followed by Christina McKelvey. Gordon Lindhurst <coughs> is convener of Economy, Jobs and Fair Work. Uh, Gordon, please. Um, thank you, convener. Uh, First Minister, you'll be aware that the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee has been carrying out an inquiry into economic data available to us here in Scotland. Um, the Scottish Government statisticians produce a wide range of useful statistics used by your government to inform policy. Uh, one of the questions that's been raised, or a number of questions have been raised about this by witnesses in evidence sessions. So my question, first of all, uh, do you consider that the combined role of the government as a producer and user of economic data is effective? And secondly, would it be better to have um, an economic statistic producer who is independent of government? I mean, I, I take the, you know, the, the way we produce statistics, um, I think, you know, has, I mean, I, if, if you had statisticians sitting here, they would tell you that they were independent in terms of how they produce statistics. Uh, there's been a lot of improvement made over uh, the years uh, to the, the quality of the data that the Scottish government uh, produces. Um, it is more comprehensive, I think, than for other parts of, of the UK and, and for other devolved administrations. Uh, we, uh, our statisticians use quite a, a varied uh, array of, of sources for the data. You know, some of the data is collected from businesses directly. Uh, some are, are derived from UK-wide surveys. Uh, sometimes we, we fund top-up samples of UK surveys. There are some areas where I think it's, it's acknowledged that there are deficiencies in the the, the, the data that's produced in Scotland and capital investment, for example, it's quite difficult to uh, disaggregate uh, data for different parts of, of the UK, you know, imports uh, of goods and services between the rest of the UK and the rest of the world. Again, there are some issues there. So I'm very open and we will certainly be, be very open to working with your committee as the inquiry takes its course as to how we can further improve and listen to any suggestions that, that come forward. But the, the rules and regulations that go around both the production of statistics and the handling of statistics by governments uh, are very rigorously ad adhered to. In fact, in terms of uh, things like pre-release access to statistics, very recently these uh, rules have been uh, quite significantly uh, tightened. And it used to be, if you take the unemployment data, it used to be that governments uh, had... Uh, 
some uh, access to those statistics before it's released. That doesn't happen uh, at all anymore. So we uh, see these statistics at the same time as everybody else does. So, you know, I, I would say that the system we have is pretty robust. Uh, but of course, if there are ways we can improve it, either in terms of the quality of the data or, you know, the, the confidence around how that data is produced, I'm certainly open to listening to it. Um, and so I take it you agree that uh, for the public to have confidence, not just in the Scottish Government, but also in this Parliament, they have to have confidence that statistics or data available is objective. And on the pre-release point, you agree then that government ministers shouldn't see data before it is made public? We, we don't make those decisions ourselves, so that's governed by uh, you know, the, the rules around uh, use of statistics. Um, it wasn't the Scottish Government's decision uh, to, to not have pre-release access to the employment stats. Um, I think sometimes for a very, uh, there are good reasons for some pre-release access to you know, prepare uh, for dis wider debate, but these are decisions that, that we don't take ourselves. So, uh, but I absolutely agree with the first uh, point of your question, is that, of course, the, the confidence in statistics is a vital part of the confidence in overall government and the debates around the various issues that statistics uh, inform us about. What sort of statistics should government ministers have sight of before they're I, publicly made available I'm, then? I'm not, but there, there, are, there are different rules apply to different statistics right now. Uh, so it used to be, I think, uh, now uh, somebody will correct this if I'm getting this wrong, but for employment stats and, and GDP, I think there is still some pre-release access for GDP stats, uh, which I think is probably about 24 hours. Uh, it used to be the same for employment, which is now not the case. But those are not, we don't decide that. That's uh, you know d d decided by the, the sort of rules that I think the Statistics Authority uh, or the ONS decide uh, what those rules are. I, I don't, I'm not saying, you know, I've, I've mentioned this as a kind of illustrative example. I'm not saying I feel particularly strongly about it. If you're asking any minister, they or any politician, you want as much ability to be prepared for debates as possible. But at the end of the day, we live with whatever the rules are. And, you know, at the moment, we don't have pre-release access to employment stats. And, you know, that's, that's as it is. Uh, on. Uh, Christina McKelvey, followed by Claire Adamson. Christina McKelvey, Convener of Equalities and Human Rights. Christina, please. Thank you very, very much, uh, Convener. First Minister, you'll know that inquiry, to, inquiry by the United Nations Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities into the progress of implementing the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities found the UK guilty of grave and systematic violation of rights and creating a human catastrophe. In that report, the Scottish Government were rightly praised for its actions to mitigate the effects of welfare reform and other uh, social change. Can, the, can you tell us, First Minister, what your programme for government plans to do to ensure that people with disabilities in Scotland are treated with firstly care uh, and dignity and respect? Um, well, obviously, the, the UN report, firstly, I think, is a source of deep embarrassment and shame uh, to, to the UK Government uh, to have the United Nations describe uh, policies for disabled people as leading to a human catastrophe is is something you would never want to hear in, in a you know, country like, like the UK. So I hope that that's making a lot of people sit up and take notice in, in the UK government. Um, you're right that we were uh, commended positively in that report for certain things, uh, our disability action plan, the involvement of people with disabilities in uh, the development of our social security system. Uh, our responsibility is on a number of levels to make sure that as we develop policy, we are taking account of the, the views of people with disabilities, and, and that will be across a whole range of, of policy areas. I'm, I'm not sitting here saying we will always get that absolutely right, but we will always seek to make sure that that voices, or those voices are heard very loudly. But at a much more sort of tangible uh, level, we, we need to make sure social security is the, the prime example at the moment, that as we are designing policies, um, and how people access benefits and what the, the, the benefits are, that they have dignity and respect and care and compassion absolutely at their heart. Because, you know, there'll, there'll be different practical illustrations of this across the UK welfare system just now. But if you're looking to sort of characterise what's gone wrong with the UK welfare system, um, it's that it seems to have lost any sense of care and compassion and dignity. And that's in terms of the, the devolution of powers, uh, that's what we're 
determined that we will put back into that system. Some of what you're asking me will go back to Joanne Lamont's questions about particular experiences of people with disabilities in the health service or in other parts of, of the public sector, and we need to make sure that we are very alive to that and trying to learn from those experiences um, in whatever area of public policy is being uh, looked at. Yep, thanks very much, First Minister. Um, in your recent programme for government, you had expressed, and you've done this over a number of years now, uh, the development of a rights-based society and how, the, how that will work. That's obviously of very pertinent interest to, to my committee, given that we're doing a piece of work on this parliament being a guarantor of human rights. Uh, one of the other issues that, that, that we have dealt with over the past year and, and look forward to dealing with in the, the years coming is around about children. So that rights-based society, that voice in society from the most vulnerable in some cases are, are our kids. Um, can you tell me uh, a about a wee bit more about the proposal to further incorporate the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child and where you think that will address some of the concluding observations from the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child? Um, obviously, when we make policy just now, um, and members will have experience of this in, in different areas of policy, we try to incorporate the principles of the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child or any uh, relevant UN Convention. Um, so to that extent, we already... Uh, try to embed it across all, all areas of policy. But as we indicated in the programme for government, I think the time is right to look at whether we, uh, which has been called for by many, whether we would do, uh, it would be appropriate to more formally incorporate the UN Convention into domestic law. And as people know, that would mean that uh, the, the rights in the Convention were justiciable before uh, our, our own courts. Now, what we need to do uh, before making that decision is do a, a complete audit of, of what the implications of that would be, where in Scottish government policy it, it might require changes in order to make that feasible. So that piece of work is going to be taken forward over the next period, and then we'll come to a view about how we further embed the convention, whether that is through, uh, you know, particular action in particular policy areas or in this wholesale incorporation. I, you can probably tell from uh, what I said in the programme for government and what I'm saying just now is I'm, I'm pretty sympathetic to this notion of, of incorporation. Uh, but, you know, it, it has... Often things like incorporating conventions are talked about as if they're symbolic things to show that you're serious about something, but actually it has really practical implications. So if we were going to take that step, we would have to make sure that the government was doing everything necessary to, to, to live up to that and uh, be uh, confident that all of our policies across all of government could withstand those challenges that would inevitably come. So we'll keep your committee up to date with uh, that work as it develops. Thanks very much. Thank you. And finally, Claire Adamson, Convener of Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments. Claire, please. Thank you, Convener. Um, First Minister, um, in your own words, um, yeah, it's an ambitious legislative programme that we have in front of us. And we've heard from many of the conveners today about concerns about capacity, the opportunities for post legislative scrutiny. Um, so in, just in general terms, I wondered if you had any response to the um, report from the Commissioner on parliamentary reform as how, how that might impact going forward. Well, in very general terms, um, I think it's a good piece of work. I mean, there will be aspects of it I'm, I'm more supportive of than, than others, I guess, and I won't get into the specifics of it, mainly really because I, I and, you know, this is that's a pretty fundamental view. I, I don't think it's for government to decide uh, how Parliament, if Parliament reforms itself and in what ways Parliament reforms itself. That is a matter for Parliament, for all of us as, as parliamentarians. Uh, the government is certainly open. We've been very... Uh, open to some of the changes that have been made already. You know, the, the lengthening of First Minister's questions, for example, was, was actually my suggestion after the election last year. I'm not saying I've always enjoyed the, the practical experience of it. Um, we've been very keen and, and happy to uh, go along with the, the other changes to First Minister's questions, the, the drop-in of the the, the leader's standard questions, the, the there's an urgent question being taken this afternoon. I think these are all sensible uh, steps to make this parliament relevant and and a bit more flexible in how it deals with issues than perhaps uh, it has been in the past. So I'm, I'm open, as is the government, to, to the reform agenda, and we will contribute uh, to this process, both in offering our views as government, offering, uh, I suppose, evidence of, of how certain changes would impact positively, negatively, or indifferently on the work of government. But ultimately, decisions around the reform of Parliament have to be for Parliament to decide, not for government. We have to, as government, we have to 
uh, operate within the, the rules of the Parliament, whatever they are. Thank you for that first answer. I think one of the most significant um, changes would, would be in the area of legislative scrutiny as recommended by the report, including the establishment of a legislative standards body. But from my own reading of it, it actually expands what the committees would do at the moment. So it's looking at um, pre-legislative scrutiny, which we're hearing from the education committees happening already, um, but also the possibility of a pause and a, 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 a reversal back to stage two of the committee process, all of which would give you much more challenges in terms of the timescales for ambitious programmes. So um, in terms of getting the balance right, how do you think um, we, we can work going forward to ensure that the, the balance and the, the confidence of the committee conveners that legislative scrutiny is happening um, uh, meets the requirements of the government? I'm at, at risk of, of sounds as if I'm trying to cop out answering your question. I'm not sure it is possible in these things to get the balance perfect. I, I think, as my exchange with Margaret would indicate earlier on, you're always going to have tensions between a government wanting to get lots of legislation through as quickly as possible and a parliament and a committee uh, system that rightly wants to do detailed, substantive scrutiny on legislation as well as do other things. And I think we just have to work at getting that balance as right as we can. I mean, one of the things, and obviously it's, it's one of the areas that the, the Commission was mindful of, where a parliament in, in the process of taking on additional responsibility. I hope in the years to come we'll take on even more uh, responsibility. That, with, with no other reforms, that in itself has implications for the workload of committees and, and MSPs. So there are already some big questions in there for how Parliament conducts its business. Um, and that's before you talk about some of the the frustrations that I think people have about the, the depth of scrutiny and at what stage that scrutiny is happen over, happening over legislation. So I think we just need to, to continue government and parliament to, to, to work to get that balance as, as right as possible. But I don't think, I don't think, because I think we'd be setting ourselves up to fail here if we, if we you know, come at this from the idea that there's some perfect formula here that will take away the tension that always exists between a government and a parliament uh, that as a, a programme goes through, we just need to get that as right as possible. And, and remember that at the end of the day, this is not about serving the needs of government or indeed serving the needs of parliament. It's about serving the needs of better policy making and better legislation for the country as a whole. Thank you, First Minister. I can't believe we finished exactly on 1350. I don't know. It's, it's the very... expert cheering. <laughs> I, I don't think so. I think the conveners have been really good. Um, can I ask if you have any concluding remarks you wish to make, First Minister? Uh, no, I, I think you said, uh, you'd wait and see if I still said thank you at the end, so um, I'm still saying thank you at the end, so I think that was a, <laughs> well, a useful session. Well, we obviously haven't done our job then. Uh, can, I, can I thank the conveners, thank you First Minister, and I close this meeting. Thank you. Thank you.